This is a lesson for how to read a text, a very small piece of text, extremely closely. Now this is kind of the area of English class that a lot of students roll their eyes at. It's easy enough to be asked, you know, what's the meaning of an overall book? What is it all about? It seems a little bit more annoying to be asked, well, what do these two words mean? What are all the possible meanings of just these sentences here, this one sentence? See all the metaphors and all the different meanings. And I've seen, you know, pictures online and, and images where students make fun of English teachers for trying to say, oh, this means all these different things. And the author really just didn't mean any of that. That may seem true, but it's not. The author frequently, if you're reading it for a class, if you've been assigned a really great piece of literature, did mean for you to come up with all sorts of different meanings. Authors who last are that good. That's why you're reading them. James Joyce, the famous Irish author, there's a story about him where he was talking to a friend, and the friend said, Oh, how is your book going? And he said, Good, I, I wrote all day. And the friend said, Oh, so you must have written a lot today. And he said, No, I wrote two sentences. And the friend said, Oh, you were just looking for the perfect words then. And he said, No, I had the words all day. I knew exactly which words I wanted. I just didn't know the order. I had to find the perfect order. And so if James Joyce can spend an entire day on two sentences that he already wrote, but just wanted to organize the right way, then we can spend a few minutes analyzing a few sentences and thinking about all the possible meanings. And what I want you to really think about is how close reading is a bit like being a detective, like Sherlock Holmes. Let's look and see what that means. There's a famous aspect of all the Sherlock Holmes tales. It's called Holmesian deduction. This is when Sherlock applies every skill he has to try and figure out something that's actually just right there in front of everyone's eyes if we all just had the ability to see what he sees. Let's take an example from this recent version of the Sherlock Holmes story. This is the modern BBC retelling. And you'll see in this scene that Sherlock is talking to the police and they think that they have an open and shut case where a person appears to commit suicide. They're looking at the crime scene, and Sherlock says, no, this is a murder. It's obviously a murder, and they don't believe him. Here's how he proves his point. The wound's on the right side of his head. And? Van Coombe is left-handed. Requires quite a bit of contortion. Left-handed? Oh, I'm amazed you didn't notice. All you have to do is look around this flat. Coffee table on the left-hand side, coffee mug handle pointing to the left. Power sockets habitually use the ones on the left. Pen and paper on the left-hand side of the phone because he picked it up with his right and took down messages with his left. You want me to go on? No, I think you've covered oh, it. I might as well. I'm almost at the bottom of the list. There's a knife on the breadboard with butter on the right side of the blade. Because he used it with his left, it's highly unlikely that a left-handed man would shoot himself in the right side of his head. Conclusion, someone broke in here and murdered him. Oh now, obviously, we don't all have the ability to do this, and Sherlock doesn't really have the ability to do this. It's a fantasy that you could notice all of these things so immediately. But in a way, this kind of skill is what we're trying to develop in a small part as readers, to be able to look at the text and notice all of the clues, because the authors who are great do not make the meaning obvious. They leave a thousand series of small clues for us to see all the possible deeper meanings. And what Sherlock does as a detective is he just looks and he assesses what's there, he finds the patterns, and then he makes a deduction. He draws a conclusion based upon the available evidence. An English teacher does not want you to just make something up because it sounds fancy and it sounds really deep. It should have to do with the text. You should be reading really closely, just like he's reading that crime scene, and coming to serious, deep, and reliable conclusions. So let's look at how we can take Sherlock's process and translate it into the writing and reading world. So here's this procedure. Six steps to kind of apply Holmesian deduction skills to close reading.
And what I'm going to do is use Samuel Coleridge's The Rime of the Ancient Mariner as a sample text. So this is a poem, a ballad that was written many, many years ago. And we're going to look at how we can read just one stanza and find all sorts of deeper meanings into it. But first, let's look at the procedure. And this is what you would want to copy down in your notes so you have this procedure you know, for forever. And if you choose to print it from my website, you can do that as well. So it's six steps. The first thing we have to do is just read the text we want to study. A few sentences, a paragraph, even one sentence. And just make sure we understand what it literally means. We can't get to deeper interpretations until we're sure what the author means in terms of the literal story. What is the character doing? What is happening? What are we picturing in our head? What is going on? First, we want to make sure we know that. Now, once we know that, we can go to step two. And that will start to lead us to the deeper meanings. And the first thing we need to do is analyze the language, the words that are used. Study them. Study the phrases, the sentences, the words, and find patterns. If there's a deeper meaning to this part of the text, you will see some kind of pattern or you'll see something that stands out, an irregularity. Sometimes the author will use a word or a phrase that doesn't normally get used. If he or she has done that, there's a reason. If something's particularly memorable or affecting, meaning it you know, emotionally affects you, or it's just out of the ordinary, that's what you want to notice now. Now three, once we have a set of things that stand out, just like with Sherlock, the butter knife stood out, the pad and pen stood out. You are finding words that have stood out to you. Now that you've found them, you have to formulate questions. And it's very simple. Just turn them into why questions. Why are these patterns there? Why did those words that are irregular words show up? Why is this part memorable? Why is this out of the ordinary? It's very simple. Turn your observations into questions. The fourth step is to try and answer them. Come up with every possible meaning, and this is where you can go crazy. Anything that comes to you, write down. So you want to try and base your answers on the text and use the context around the part that you're reading to come up with every possible explanation. Sometimes you see the author is alluding to some other story. That might help you answer it. Sometimes you need to just define the words that you don't know or look up information about them. And sometimes you just need to think really hard about the story and what's going on to answer these questions. But if you gather as many possible answers, not necessarily concerned yet if they're good answers or if they're possible, you know, really likely to be true answers, just finding answers is all you want to do here and come up with as many ideas as you can. And now the fifth thing is what you want to do, which is what Sherlock always does in his mind without telling anyone. He considers all the possibilities, and then he rules out the ones that are impossible. And this is the key moment for you as students. Because I read lots of essays, again, where students want to impress the English teacher, and so they come up with all of these crazy interpretations that they say, oh, this is probably what the English teacher wants. A story about you know, a little girl and her friend, and then you say, oh, it's a metaphor for the creation of the universe. That sounds really great, but if it has nothing to do with the real meaning of the story, then it's not going to impress an English teacher. We're interested in real possibilities. So what you do in step five is, of all the possible answers you came up with, cross out the ones that are just impossible, that seem to go too far that are inductive. And what that means is you're putting in your own ideas rather than drawing out possible ideas from the text. So keep the possible answers that make sense, are good possible answers, and clearly relate to the text. They come out of the text rather than you putting in your own opinions to the text. And step six is very simple. Just expand upon what you have left from step five. So now that you have some possible answers that seem pretty good and better than others, now go as deep as you can with them. Gather as much insight and just explain 
in full detail what you mean. And when you've done that, you likely have a strong interpretation of this very small piece of text. So let's see an example. 